Estrella is this little girl. She's four years old. And when she walks into the room with her mother, she's wearing this big puffy jacket because the room is very, very cold. And her jacket is covered with all of these stars. And there's this big blue star that spans her zipper and it glitters and it sparkles. And so I say to Estrella, I say, Estrella, is that your favorite star? And she looks at me as if I am just another one of those clueless adults that inhabits a child's life, and she shakes her head no. And instead she points right here to the smallest star in her jacket that's this bright, fiery red. And so I ask her, I say, Estrella, why is that your favorite star? She looks down at her shoes, and then she looks back up at me, and she says, because it's the one nearest my heart. Now, when she says this to me, little Estrella is in jail. She's in jail with her mother because in their native country of Guatemala, they had been threatened with death. And the Guatemalan government refused to protect them. So in order to save their lives, they fled to the United States to seek protection. And when they arrived at the border and applied for asylum, the federal immigration system put them in jail and scheduled them for immediate deportation. Now, honoring and safeguarding the right to refuge is an intractably difficult thing to do, not just for the United States, but nations all around the world find it increasingly challenge, challenging to protect the principle of refuge, particularly in moments of crisis. Now, Estrella and her mother are refugees in the true, pure sense of the word, yet our immigration system's response was to jail and deport, which is the exact opposite of providing refuge. And our national history is filled with these instances where we have deported refugees back to very dangerous places, and then after the fact, we have come to regret it. And Estrella and her mother are merely the latest examples of this recurring pattern. And that's the question, why? Why does this keep happening? Why is it so? And what can we, as a national community, do to disrupt those forces that make it so very difficult in a moment of crisis to protect the principle of refuge. Almost exactly two years ago today, I was standing on the rooftop of a very swank law office in a very posh part of Washington, D.C., with this dramatic view of the White House, with other lawyers and advocates sharing hors d'oeuvres, being passed around by these fancy-dressed waiters and having an absolutely marvelous time. When one of the immigrant rights lawyers from Colorado asked me, said, hey, have you heard about the secret detention center in the middle of the New Mexican desert where refugee children from Central America, literally infants, two, four, six years old, are in jail with their mothers and scheduled for immediate deportation? Now, we knew that the Northern Triangle of Central America was on the verge of collapse, that vast parts of the geographic territory of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador were beyond the control of the legitimate governments of those countries, and were in fact being governed by these higher-order gangs, not street gangs or turf gangs like we know of them here, but these sophisticated political entities that ruled physical space with violence in a post-ideological conflict that was taking place. Adults were murdering children, children were being forced to murder other children, and some of the most dangerous places to be for a woman or a child in 2014, 2015, or 2016 was in the Northern Triangle of Central America. And there was no one working in this field who did not know this, which is why it made absolutely no sense that the United States would be jailing children and women and entire families and scheduling them for their immediate deportation without providing any meaningful access to the asylum system. That would be against the law. And the United States wouldn't do that. This is what I thought. But the reports from the people who had been there were just so credible that a team of advocates here from Oregon followed the trail back to the detention center in Artesia, New Mexico, to see for ourselves. And what we found was that, was that it was all absolutely true. There were hundreds and hundreds of children and their mothers hidden in this desert jail. And the official policy was to get them all gone, get all of the women and all of the children gone, regardless of their claims of refuge and before any of them had a meaningful opportunity to apply for asylum. The official policy was to get them all gone in just a matter of weeks, and these massive incidents of deportation that were to occur at a high velocity. Now, I've studied the concept of refuge. I'm a lawyer by trade, I'm a lawyer at heart. I've spent my entire legal career believing in and defending rule of law principles, that there is a law, that we can know what the law is, and that we can enforce the law and enforce rights. That is, we can make the government do something, we can make the government stop doing something through an orderly legal process. Now, that might sound naive, 
but I do believe in it. And in that belief, I believe that rule of law principles become reality. But creating systems that protect the rights of refugees defies that belief. It is and has been so very difficult to protect the rights of persons who are fleeing persecution. The international system for the protection of refugees came about because of World War II and the great failure of nations to provide shelter to vulnerable populations fleeing peril. After the war, the United States, along with 141 other countries, entered into an international agreement called the Convention Related to the Status of Refugees. The Convention and its protocol were meant to provide a forward-looking mechanism to protect humans from persecution and to prevent what happened during the war from happening again. Now, refugees and asylees are functionally identical. The difference is geography. A refugee seeker is outside the United States seeking protection, whereas an asylum seeker is inside the United States seeking protection. That is, you have to be physically present in the United States in order to file for asylum. Now, that said, no one in Central America can file for refugee status because it's not possible. There is no refugee screening mechanism there. And so in order to seek protection, because they could not file for refugee status there, the only way that Estrella and her mother could do this was to physically come to the United States and file for asylum. And so that's what they did. To get asylum is really tough. The evidentiary burdens are high, and the process generally takes place in this complex adversarial court system before a prosecutor and a judge. And most people fail. And that's with a good lawyer before a good judge and lots of resources for evidence and witness preparation. In the summer of 2014, when Estrella and her mother sought asylum, exactly like today, the politics and optics of the immigration debate were ascendant over the law of international protection, and everything that is normally hard about proving an asylum claim had suddenly become nearly impossible. There is no guarantee of a lawyer in the asylum process. So by design, Estrella and her mother were on their own to navigate this brutally complex system and to defend themselves by themselves before a prosecutor and a judge. Detention is authorized in the asylum process, and here detention was being used against infants and toddlers and, and entire families. Estrella and her mother were detained in a remote location under hostile conditions with hundreds and hundreds of other women and children. And to aggravate the matter, U.S. law essentially creates a force field around the detention center that prohibits anyone from challenging in court an illegal denial of asylum or an erroneous order to deport a refugee. So it seemed like a fait accompli that when we arrived in the detention center, that every woman and every child was going to be deported back to some most dangerous places on Earth, and there was nothing we could do about it because the asymmetry in power and the numerical gap between the advocates and the refugees was just too immense to bridge. And that if we were going to save just a life, just one life, like Estrella's life, we would have to do something radically different. We would have to do something that hadn't been done before. And that is when we turned to people like you, the crowd, and the power of human compassion. Alone, the lawyers in the system could not make the protection system work right, but the compassionate, connected crowd could. Now, crowdsourced refugee rights defense strategy allowed the lawyers on the ground to immediately address the power asymmetry, the proportionality problem, and the fact that we had no time till the next wave of deportations. So first, we harnessed the power of the crowd to nationalize the response beyond the handful of advocates in the center, beyond the isolation of the New Mexican desert. Now, cell phones were prohibited, but computers weren't. So we created a technological platform to weave together hundreds and hundreds of volunteer lawyers and advocates and teachers and preachers and students and mothers. There were a lot of mothers. To involve them in the hard work of defending refugee rights. Second, we established a ground game that tied together the on-the-ground volunteers with the crowd so they could act in unison, like a hive. We knew we couldn't ask a volunteer just to give up her life and drop everything to do this work. That's one of the problems of refugee defense. It takes place in these faraway locations under really difficult circumstances, putting it out of reach for most. So instead, we created a system where we would ask a volunteer to give up just one week of her life. 
And each week, a new team of volunteer advocates would arrive on the ground, switch out with the old team, and join the hive. And then, using the vast power of the crowd, we could leverage, we could leverage the crowd with just a handful of advocates in the center, and we could represent every woman and every child detained in secret. Third, we turn to the crowd to rebalance the asymmetry in power. Here's the dilemma. In the asylum process, the deportation officer has all of the power. In Estrella, the little girl whose life is in danger has none. And as a lawyer, I only have as much power as my client. I'm merely a funnel for her power. And as Estrella's lawyer, I could not protect her because the system had taken away all of my lawyer tools. The Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, that's the amendment that protects life and liberty through the due process of law. It was not powerful enough on its own to save Estrella's life. So we turned to the crowd to build power outside the Fifth Amendment, to slow the deportations down, to create time and space to let the Fifth Amendment breathe again. And finally, the nationwide network of advocates collected insane, and I mean insane amounts of data in real time about what was happening, qualitative and quantitative pieces of information, dozens and dozens of data points about each interaction and event. And with this data, the crowd could dynamically adapt and predict what we needed to do next, wait, rather than waiting to react defensively. And with this data, we could advocate and litigate to shape the system in the way it was supposed to be. To get all of the women and all of the children gone in just a matter of weeks required that the waves of deportation be massive and fast. And indeed they were. In just a dozen days after the detention center opened, the waves began. And to be in that space, that physical place, when all of these living souls would just vanish overnight, was like nothing I had ever experienced before or since. Everyone was going to be deported. All of these little children were going to be deported back to some of the most dangerous places on earth, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. And so, I want to show you this. Those white dots, those are children and women who were deported from the center. You are seeing the opening days of the detention center and the beginning of the massive waves. The red dots are lawyers, and they're acting all alone, they're by themselves and everyone is going to be deported, and we see that, and we cannot stop it. And so we turn to the crowd, and check it out. The next wave of removals is smaller and farther apart. And the dynamic adaptation begins, and check it out. Deportations fall 97% until they vanish. space and time for the Fifth Amendment to breathe again. And what did we do with the Fifth Amendment? For all of the women and children who were not deported and who remained detained, we won a lot of cases. So recall that everyone was supposed to be deported, regardless of their claim of refuge, and before anyone had any meaningful access to the asylum system. Alone, the lawyers were achieved a 33% passage rate for the initial threshold asylum screening. In a crowdsourced refugee defense strategy, we now approach 100% passage rate of the threshold screening. <laughs> Recall that most people fail in their asylum claims, and this system had been designed so that everyone would fail. In a crowdsourced refugee defense strategy. We have won 98% of every claim that we've tried on the merits in an adversarial system before a judge. A crowdsourced system that collectivized, nationalized, and dynamically adapted to data had delivered these unheard of, amazing client outcomes. The crowd had forced the system to work right, and by working right, the system had proved its own worth. These women and children were bona fide refugees, and the narrative need for rapid removals was disrupted, and the policy justifications for the mass incarceration of asylum-seeking children and women was qualitatively and quantitatively proven to be bankrupt, and the secret detention center in Artesia, New Mexico, shut down. And I wish I could say that was the end of the story, because that would make for a great TED Talk. (laughs) 
But the deportation system is, is dynamic too, and it adapted to our success. And it has recently built the nation's largest, if not the world's largest, immigrant jail in Texas, operated by a private prison for profit. Designed yet once again for the mass incarceration of families. Now, the legal system can be very slow to adapt and change, but here we had no choice. To solve the intractable problem of defending refugee rights, we harnessed the power of the crowd to create proportionality, and symmetry, and power through innovative technology and human compassion. To create a system where every meritorious claim could win every time, but that is only if we remain vigilant because the work is ongoing. Thank you. <laughs>